presents to you Professor Huerta de Soto. Now, how do you present someone who apparently is very well known to all of you, eventually someone who is much better known to you than he is to me? So I decided I shall instead tell you a brief anecdote, and people then say, well, okay, but keep it brief. So the rule of thumb is an anecdote should never be longer than you can stand in one day, which is fine. But mind you, people call me the flamingo. <laughs> Some of you might know. Well, that took quite a while now, isn't it? Now, as you might know, as some of you might know, I've had a previous career before I returned to academia, before I became Professor of International Capital Markets. I previously worked in investment banking, I worked for Morgan Stanley, I worked for Barclays Capital. And I remember overhearing a conversation between two colleagues. One, a fixed income strategist, and the other, our chief economist based in Frankfurt. And they were wondering which economist actually still has an influence which appears to be noteworthy. So the question was, which type of academic textbook do you still believe adds value on top of what can be considered to become knowledge now? And, I'm not joking, it was the first time I stumbled across the name of Werther de Soto. Apparently, I started familiarizing myself with this piece of literature, and I will not go so far as to say I'm a dogmatist, I'm a pure scholar of Austrian economics, but at least I figured that there were enough ideas to be sufficiently interesting to at least help the woman very few to set up this conference, to organize this conference, which, and there can be no doubt about that, strongly benefits from Professor Dr. Lissoto kindly agreeing to deliver tonight's keynote speech. So that's it, and you can see I'm standing on two feet now. That's it, why don't you join me in, I would say, a witty, a perhaps interesting speech on God and anarcho-capitalism. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Muchas gracias y muchas gracias. Thank you. Thank you, Liv, and thank you, you all, for being here today. Once again, it gives me a great satisfaction and joy to be able to address you all at this second Madrid conference on Austrian economics. Typically, my keynote lectures cover topics related to economic theory or libertarian philosophy, but today I am going to make an exception. A few years back, Professor Maria Blanco interviewed me for a book on the leading Spanish economists. And I stressed that in the multidisciplinary approach of the Austrian school, it is very important that we not overlook theology. Philosophy and law are, of course, very necessary and important. But theology is also very important. And it is an area I think we must explore as Austrian economists. Today, I'm going to share a series of reflections on the sphere of theology and its relationship to the libertarian movement. Well, I would like to start from a premise. My initial premise will be that God exists. Of course, this will come as a shock to many of you. Others, the believers, will find it obvious. Still others will have their doubts. Many will be put off, especially in a group of economists, philosophers, freedom-loving people and libertarians, like the group I am now speaking to. However, I would ask that, at least for the sake of argument, even those who do not believe in God, make an effort of imagination. Please, imagine for the next few minutes that God exists. 
And that is the starting premise of my entire talk today. And what do I mean by God? By God, I mean the supreme loving creator of all the things and creatures that have been created. This is my praxeological definition of God. Elsewhere, I have developed at some length the theory that one of the most important creatures to be created is precisely the human being, whom God created in his own image and likeness. And that if there is a point of connection between the image and likeness of God and of man, it lies precisely in creative entrepreneurial ability. Entrepreneurship, the human capacity to discover, to see and to create new things, in Latin, remember, in emprendo, prendi, prensum, connects God and man. I am not going to elaborate on this theory now, since you are already familiar with it. And also it is expounded in several of my books and papers. Today, I will go a step further and attempt to demonstrate that God is not only the supreme loving creator of all things and beings, but also that God is a libertarian. And this is going to be the main contention of my remarks this evening. So, what does it mean to be a libertarian? Perhaps it is idle of us to pose this question in the context of this conference. A libertarian is someone who loves human freedom, which is, of course, one and indivisible. Libertarians defend free enterprise, the creative capacity of human beings, and the spontaneous market order. Above all, libertarians abhor the organized systematic coercion of those monopolistic agencies of violence we know as states. In several writings, for instance, in my article Classical Liberalism versus Anarcho-Capitalism, I have examined the reasons why the state is not only unnecessary, but also highly inefficient, and more importantly, immoral, and why we must dismantle it. So, what does it mean to say that God is a libertarian? What meaning should we attribute to this expression? It means that God, the Lord of all the universe, who has created his laws and everything from nothing, and who therefore has absolute power over the earth and the rest of the universe, God nevertheless does not use force, but on the contrary, always leaves his creatures free. And he gives them the freedom even to reveal against him. There are the fallen angels, for instance. These are spiritual beings who rebuild against their own creator. And God leaves also human beings free to rebel against him. But Curiously enough, human beings are more fortunate than the angels, the fallen angels, because happily humans have been redeemed. In other words, God forgives human beings again and again, and he allows them to get up and start over. God, of course, in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. He always lets people do as they will. He lets things happen. He allows the universe with the order he has created to spontaneously evolve by itself. God lets do. He lets pass. So the world goes on by itself. 
laissez faire, laissez passer, le monde va de lui-même, could be the motto of our libertarian God. And this is true, even though man tests God again and again and demands that he manifest his supreme power, that he gives us crystal clear and deniable signs of his power. And only then we will believe in him, of course. But God does not fall for this, because a forced conversion, the result of a cataclysm, for example, would be contrary to the inherent freedom which characterizes the supreme loving creator of, of all things. At the time of Jesus, the Silots, and the world is still full of Silots, were crying out for the creation of an all-powerful world state, a kingdom of the Messiah, who would exercise his power and impose his will on the whole world. People continually asked for a spectacular signs as well. When Jesus hung, crucified on the cross, they mocked him and said, if you are the son of God, come down from the cross, and then we will believe in you, of course. But Jesus, God the Son, a libertarian, did not come down from the cross. And why did he not make fire rain down, break devastation, and that manifest the will of the Supreme Creator? Even apostles, as beloved, by Jesus, as James and John, no less, fall into this temptation when they ask Jesus for permission to call down fire from heaven and show God's power. I will read this passage word by word. We find it in St. Luke in chapter 9. It says, and I quote, On their way they entered a village of the Samaritans, to make ready for him. But they did not receive him, because his face was set toward Jerusalem. When his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them, and then they went on to another village. Why this reaction of Jesus? Because God, in this case God the Son, is a libertarian. And even though he has the power and capacity to establish, for instance, the best welfare state imaginable, God the Son, Jesus, does not follow any such a plan. We have the example of his best known speech. The Sermon of the Mount, which includes, of course, the Beatitudes. There were a crowd of people, and Jesus later took pity on them because they had nothing to eat. And he performed the miracle of the multiplication of the loaves. Everybody ate. All were satisfied. And they realized that Jesus was capable of feeding the whole world free of charge. It seemed to them like a paradise. And what was the reaction of the people? I am afraid that rather than internalizing the message of the Beatitudes, they were tempted by the chance to achieve then and there the best welfare state imaginable. And they immediately wanted to appoint Jesus head of the state. In short, to make him king. Let us see how the Gospel of St. John puts it. It reads, and I quote, When Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. And why? Because God the Son is a libertarian. And the kingdom of God is not from this world. 
Jesus himself says this to a terrified official of the Roman Empire, who is also in charge of judging him. My kingdom is not from this world. This may appear to mean that there are two types of kingdoms or two types of states. The kingdoms of this world, which on their own level would be legitimate, remember, give to the emperor the things that are the emperor's. And the kingdom of God, of heaven, and give to God the things that are God's. That is the standard interpretation, which has prevailed up to now. But I believe it is completely false, from beginning to end. When Jesus is asked the trick question about paying taxes to the emperor, he gets around it in a very intelligent way. Show me the coin used for the tax. Whose head is this? The emperor's. Give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperor's, and to God the things that are God's. And he avoids problems for the time being. But look, at no point does he specify what is the emperor's. Maybe nothing. In fact, Jesus never paid any tax himself in his life. The only time he had to pay a tax, he instructed St. Peter the following, and I quote, cast a hook and take the first fish that comes up, and when you open its mouth, you will find a shekel. Take that and give it to them for me and for yourself. This is in St. Matthew chapter 17. I believe the correct interpretation is that the kingdom of God, which is exact the opposite of the kingdoms of this world or states, and which never systematically uses violence and coercion, is a kingdom that has already arrived. It has been given to us free in an act of immense mercy and love. Deus caritas est and it should lead to the dismantling of the kingdoms or states of this world. Because God is a libertarian, and he made man precisely in his own image and likeness. But what are the origin and the nature of the states or kingdoms of this world? Without a doubt, and I am going to try to demonstrate this here this evening, the state is the main instrument of evil, of the devil. And I will show that this is true. But first, allow me to make a brief digression on the origin of the state, the origin of the kingdom or kingdoms of this world. Perhaps, the clearest explanation is found in the Old Testament, in the book of 1 Samuel. There we read how the kingdoms of this world or states emerged with a deliberate act of human rebellion of the Jewish people against God. We will read from 1 Samuel chapter 8. Up until then, the Jewish people had lived in a state of semi-anarchy, and had turned to a series of judges or mediators to settle their disagreements. But at a certain point, they approached Samuel and said, Give us a king to govern us. In other words, give us a state, a government. We read in 1 Samuel that Samuel was very displeased by this, and that he turned to God and said, Listen! These people expect us to give them a state. And what does God answer? He literally says the following, I quote, They have rejected me from being king over them. That is, the state, the kingdom of this world, arose as an alternative to the kingdom of God. But God is a libertarian, 
and he lets people do as they will. You want the state? Go right ahead. But please, Samuel, before they proceed, solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. And Samuel, without wasting any time, called the people together and said, So, you say you want a state? Well, this will be the ways of the king who will govern you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots, and to be his horsemen, and to run before his chariots. And he will appoint for himself commanders of thousands, and commanders of fifties, and some to plow his ground, and to reap his harvest, and to make his implements of war, and the equipment of his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers, and cooks, and bakers. He, the state, will take the best of your fields and wineyards and olive orchards and give them to his servants. He will take the tenth of your grain and of your wineyards and give it to his officers and to his servants. Just like now. He will take your men servants and maid servants and the best of your cattle and your asses and put them to his work. He will take the tenth of your flocks and you shall be his slaves. End of quote. Well, as you can see, the warning of God is very clear. And however, we still do complain. As I said, the state is the main instrument of evil. In the state, the evil one, evil number one, wields his power. And who is this evil number one? The devil, the fallen angel. What is the goal of the evil one? To destroy the work of God. To destroy the spontaneous order of the universe which includes, of course, the spontaneous order of the market. That is his goal. So, who is our enemy? Who is the true enemy of libertarians? The devil. We are up against the devil. And one of his chief manifestations is the state. He is hard, of course, but not impossible to win. Because we have an ally who is much more powerful than the devil himself. There is no doubt that the state is the embodiment of the devil. But I'm not the one who says it, no. St. Luke, the evangelist, says it. And the Pope Emeritus, Benedict XVI, Joseph Ratzinger, very well explains it in his very remarkable biography, entitled Jesus of Nazareth. In the first published of its three volumes, there is a chapter in which Ratzinger comments on each of the temptations Jesus was subjected to. And in St. Luke chapter 4 we found a description of the third temptation, the gravest and the strongest. The Gospel reads as follows, And the devil took him up and show him all the kingdoms, that is, all the states of the world, in a moment of time, and said to him, To you I will give all these authority and governments and their glory. And now the following words of the devil, recorded by the evangelists, are key. For the power of all states have been delivered to me, to the devil, and I give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it shall all be yours. End of quote. Thus, according to the devil himself, all of the states on the earth are under his command and depend on him. So we can understand now why they inflict so much harm. What does Jesus answer? Jesus says, it is written, 
you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. And why is that? Because God is a libertarian. Ratzinger himself warns that the main threat of our time lies precisely in the deification of human reason and in the attempt through pseudo-scientific so-called social engineering and the state and led by governments, authorities and experts to create nirvana, an earthly paradise here and now in the world. Humanity's great problem is that we have turned the state into a golden calf everyone worships. The state is the true antichrist. That is where humanity's problem really lies. Let us see how Ratzinger explains it in Jesus of Nazareth, because he does so very precisely. I will read his own words. He writes, and I quote, The tempter is not so crude as to suggest to us directly that we should worship the devil. He merely suggests that we choose to give priority to a planned and thoroughly organized world. The author, Raffinger, later mentions Soloviev, the theologian, as follows. Soloviev attributes to the Antichrist a book entitled The Open Way to World Peace and Welfare. This book becomes something of a new Bible, whose real message is the worship of well-being and rational planning. Benedict XVI returns to this idea in his encyclical Especialdi, in paragraph 30, where he strongly condemns, and I quote, the hope of creating a perfect world thanks to scientific knowledge and to scientifically based politics. Ratzinger also gave a wonderful speech before the German parliament, in which he said, quoting St. Augustine, Without the rule of law, what else is the state but a great band of robbers? And you and I know that both today and historically, and both quantitatively and qualitatively, the main violators and enemies of the rule of law have been precisely the state and the governments. To put it in another way, the statement, a state governed by the rule of law, is a contradiction in terms. There is no greater enemy of law, with capital L, than the state. We are daily witnesses to this from the time we get up to the time we go to bed. And if the chief enemy of law is the, is the state, and a government or a state which is not subject to the rule of law is actually a band of robbers, the conclusion of the syllogism is crystal clear. All states and governments are bands of robbers. Incidentally, Ratzinger makes another very important point. He says, Do you know when the church got off track? It is quite simple. The moment it became the official state church. He says it got off track. Not as you might think with the Edict of Thessalonica, which made it the official church of the empire, but before that with Constantine the Edict of Milan, Religious Freedom, the year 313. But a few years later, in the year 321, what did Constantine do? He declared Sunday an official day of rest throughout the empire in honor of the Christians. But several years later, at the Council of Nicaea, he said, okay, you bishops, can assemble and arrive at agreements, but this will be valid only if I, Constantine, approve them. After that, the church was lost. It became a state institution. And now we can understand all the historical atrocities committed. 
since the church in many cases became an instrument of evil as the official state church. That is why, according to Ratzinger, it is vital to radically separate the two institutions, the church and the state. However, from an intellectual standpoint, the greatest harm lies elsewhere. For centuries and centuries, the church has been the official state church. And as a result, a legion of intellectuals, of theologians, have devoted all of their efforts to attempting to justify the unjustifiable, namely that the state is legitimate. Let us hope that the church changes direction and that starting now it overcomes its Stockholm syndrome and begins to denounce the state rather than the spontaneous market order. I believe I have established that out of love God gives us his kingdom, that God is a creator and a libertarian, and that the main threat to the kingdom of God lies in the deification of human reason. The fatal conceit, the title of Hayek's last book, and especially it lies in the states or kingdoms of this world, which embody systematic evil. Then, what should be the guiding theme of our daily actions? That is obvious now. We must devote all of our intellectual and physical efforts and energy, all of our being, to the dismantling of states and the defense of God's spontaneous order based on love and voluntary cooperation. Logically, this involves promoting the market, private property, the free enterprise, and the spontaneous market order. Of course, it's a necessary but not as a sufficient condition because human beings must also have the guidance of ethics and morality. But remember, still, we must recognize that what most disciplines, precisely the weak, the bad people, is the free market. Because the market obliges us, in a context of voluntary cooperations, for instance, to engage in conversation with the others, to try to discover their needs and peacefully satisfy them. It obliges us to preserve a reputation if we want people to keep doing business with us in the future. This explains why the great Montesquieu arrived at the conclusion that wherever there is commerce, there we meet with agreeable manners. For as Pope St. John Paul II very clearly stated, in the market, man collaborates, and I quote, in a progressively expanding chain of solidarity. This chain reaches the remotest corners of the human world. Actually, I have been reviewing the statements of John Paul II, made in his Centesimus Annus, and they are really spectacular. Let us recall a few of them. John Paul II writes the following. When a company makes a profit, this means that productive factors have been properly employed and corresponding human needs have been duly satisfied. Therefore, profit is sought not out of greed, but as a sign of doing good to others. Pope John Paul II also writes, the principal task of the state is to guarantee individual freedom and private property, among other essentials, so that those who work and produce can enjoy the fruits of their labors and thus feel encouraged to work efficiently and honestly. He also says, where self-interest is violently suppressed by the state, it is replaced by a burdensome system of bureaucratic control which dries up the wellspring of initiative and creativity. 
And as you know, this happens to us every day in the oppressive environment in which we live. He also especially criticizes the welfare state. He says that, and I quote, a community of a higher order should not interfere in the internal life of a community of a lower order, depriving it of its functions. And he affirms that needs are best understood and satisfied by people who are closest to them and who act as neighbors to those in need. He criticizes the welfare state as follows. By intervening di directly and depriving society of its responsibility, the welfare state leads to a loss of human energies and an increase in public agencies, which are dominated more by bureaucratic ways of thinking than by concern for serving their clients, and which produce an enormous increase in spending. And what does John Paul II consider is the just price? Because we often hear, for example, that people must pay a just wage, for instance. But what is the just price? The Holy Father responded that it is the one, and I quote, mutually agreed upon through free bargaining. And what conclusion do I come to? I come to the conclusion that, for instance, a Catholic must be a libertarian on social issues, and the same of any other Christians. I go even further. A Christian, and of course a Catholic, must support private property anarchy. Indeed, we have just heard a defense of private property. True economic science shows that the only way a stateless system could possibly work is through the spontaneous market order and the private provision of all public goods. Private property anarchy is the highest stage of civilization conceivable. The embodiment of the kingdom of God to the greatest extent humanly possible here on earth. Or if you prefer, we can call it libertarian capitalism. Though that term, that term frightens John Paul II, he reflects on the word capitalism and basically says, he says, well, since everything negative has for decades and decades been described as capitalism, I propose to change and use another name. Which one? He says, for instance, business economy, market economy, free economy, but why? Let us call things by their names. Libertarian capitalism, private property anarchy, or the best expression of all, anarcho-capitalism. From a scientific standpoint, this expression is far more accurate than, for instance, self-government, or other terms which lead to confusion and are truly mellifluous. Let us be proud of being private property anarchists or anarcho-capitalists. Etymologically, according to the dictionary of the Spanish Royal Academy, anarchy, anarchia, means the absence of all public authority. The expression is then perfect. Everything would be private. Governments would be private governments. And there would be no public authority with an, uh, a monopoly of violence or coercion. Arcane, in Greek, comes from a word that means to rule. Arcane, rule. And also it means public authority. Anarchy, then, means no public authority. Another term that can be used is akarata, from the Greek term karatos, which means absolute power. So, kratos means absolute power. Akrasia, or akrata, means lack of absolute power. And let us recall the famous statement of Hayek, declaring himself an enemy of democracy. Demos, people, kratos, absolute power. 
He says, Hayek says, Kratos means absolute power, and I am against all kind of absolute power. Absolute power, even if it is backed by the people, is not at all viable. So Hayek proposes another system with another name, isonomy or demarchy. And you have all studied this already in the third volume of Law, Legislation and Liberty. No absolute power. Akratia. Akrata. Let us be proud to be anarcho-capitalists and akratas. And I will conclude my remarks today with some verses by a great Spanish libertarian, a great anarchist who was born in Seville, Melchor Rodríguez García. I do not know if you have heard of him. He was briefly the mayor of Madrid, precisely the last under the Spanish Republic. Together with Colonel Casado and General Cipriano Mera, also two anarchists, he staged a coup d'etat against the communist forces and those of President Negrin, who was the Stalin's puppet, to end the Spanish Civil War. And they were the ones who handed Madrid over the forces of General Franco in 1939. Melchor Rodríguez is also known as the Red Angel. And why is he known as the Red Angel? Because he saved over 12,500 prisoners in the jails of Madrid from being murdered or lynched. The illegal removal of prisoners in Madrid, which ended in the Paracuellos executions, and for which the communist Santiago Carrillo was directly responsible, was immediately halted the moment Melchor Rodríguez was appointed General Inspector of Prisons by the Minister of Justice, García Oliver, also a fellow anarchist. When Melchor Rodríguez arrived, took up his post and said, it is completely prohibited for anyone to leave the jails between 7 in the evening and 7 in the morning without my direct authorization, personal or by telephone. Immediately the executions stopped. It goes without saying that there followed a huge campaign against Melchor Rodríguez, who was a leading figure in the, in, in the anarcho-syndicalist movement in Spain. He was accused of being a traitor of, to the Republic. But he responded, You are the traitors. You have stained with blood the novel doctrine of anarchy. And he added, One may die for an ideal, but never kill for one. And perhaps the most sublime example of dying for an ideal is provided by Jesus himself. He died for the ideal of redeeming all mankind. There is no doubt that Jesus was a victim, as a matter of fact, of the reason of the state and of a political plot, a victim of a state violence. And Melchor Rodriguez was asked, We have you done this. Why do you defend the fifth columnist of Franco we have in jail? Are you perhaps a Catholic sympathizer? Melchor Rodríguez responded, I did it not because I am a Catholic, but because I am a libertarian. Probably in a world that Catholic and libertarian are, have been two sides of the same coin. In addition, Melchor Rodríguez, though he belonged to the Iberian Anarchist Federation, also belonged to a group called Los Libertos, who defended this pacifist and freedom-based views. Four months later, he was dismissed from his post and appointed General Inspector of Cemeteries in Madrid. With his team, he occupied the palace of the Marquis of Diana, here in the center of Madrid, and he began by making an inventory of all the contents of that palace. And notice how respectful of private property this anarcho-syndicalist was. When the owner recovered the palace after the war, he expressly told the authorities that not one single 
silver teaspoon was missing. The red angel, Melchor Rodriguez, did not have the chance to get a formal education. He was born into an extremely poor family, and he made a living as a bullfighter. But that career was cut short. And then he devoted himself, body and soul, to promoting the anarchist ideal. But from this freedom perspective, perspective I am talking about. When the war was over, he was tried and condemned to death by General Franco. But fortunately, and thanks to 2,500 signatures of people who were saved through his good offices, he was pardoned, and he spent a few years in jail and returned afterwards to civil life. And he lived out the rest of his days until the year 1972, in which he died, practicing the noble profession of insurance agent, which makes him doubly likable to me. Because as you know, I am chairman of an insurance company. I have no doubt that if Melchor Rodriguez had had the opportunity to receive an education, and he were here with us today, and probably in the spirit at least he is, the Red Angel would be an, ar an anarcho-capitalist. And I conclude with the verses he wrote just before he passed away. And I quote, Anarchy means beauty, love, poetry, equality, fraternity, feeling, freedom, culture, art, harmony, reason the supreme guide, science the exalted truth, life, nobility, goodness, satisfaction, joy. All this is anarchy, and anarchy is humanity. Thank you very much.